Terra firma is a Latin phrase that literally means firm land. We use this phrase to refer to the earth, to the ground that we walk on. If you are a nervous flyer like me, then you are always grateful when that plane lands and you get out of it and you put your feet on solid ground. We like to think of the ground beneath our feet as solid, and that's pretty easy for us to do here in Maine. We are not familiar with experiencing earthquakes. If you've lived here your whole life like I have, maybe once in a while we have an earth shake, but it really doesn't ever add up to an earthquake. And landslides are not common around here either. So the imagery of the psalm that's before us in Psalm 46, those first uh, three verses, has always been a little difficult for me to kind of get a grasp on. Uh, it's been hard to really appreciate it. We will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Well, on the coast, we know a little bit about seas that roar and foam. We like the storm surges that cause the spray on Scudic Point, and we like the waves that make Thunder Hole live up to its name, but we really don't know anything of the sort of seas that threaten to swallow hills. And I saw this video the other day, and maybe you saw it too. Let's take a look. As I saw those houses being swept along and swallowed by the sea, all I could think was, these are people's homes. I see years of memories moving toward destruction, countless hours of labor that were spent building homes and furnishing houses, just heading for the deep. I look there and I see those are kitchen tables in all the conversations that have been held around them, all the celebrations and the sorrows within those particular four walls of eight homes. And I couldn't help but wonder how many times and how many men and women and children over the years, likely multiple generations, had walked over the thresholds of those homes in and out day after day, year after year, down those steps, putting their feet on what they always perceived to be terra firma, solid ground. But it wasn't solid ground, which should not surprise us because geologists have been telling us for years about floating plates and things like that, blah, 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 that we don't pay any attention to because if we really dug into it, it might make us feel a little uneasy and a little unsettled and it would disturb the tranquility that we like in our ignorance but we have just seen it to be true. In a matter of moments, acres of land, family dwellings can be part of the seafloor. That literal upheaval that we just witnessed is sort of like the figurative catastrophe that's described in Psalm 46. And it's not unlike the figurative catastrophe that we're all experiencing today. We have a nation that's afflicted by a pandemic and is in turmoil over issues of race. If I were to say that we live in uncertain times, that would be a gross understatement, wouldn't it? We are living in uh, unprecedented disruption, at least in terms of, of how I've experienced life for all the 55 years that I've been around. And the shift, to me, feels pretty seismic. And even if the outcome is good, and we can believe that it could be good because the Lord tells us that he will work all things together for the good of those who love him, but even if the outcome is good. The process of getting to that good outcome has been pretty, pretty difficult on a lot of people, hugely unsettling. And that's why I want to take a look at Psalm 46 this morning, because ever since it was written, Psalm 46 has been an anchor of hope for people who are experiencing unsettling times. 
Psalm 46 has been a treasure for those who live in times where life is threatened, when life isn't making any sense. It was reportedly the favorite psalm of Martin Luther, the great reformer, the, the leader of the Protestant Reformation. And it was on this psalm that Martin Luther penned probably his most famous hymn, Ein Festberg is unser Gott. Right? You all know that one. And I said before, it's on your playlist. It's a mighty fortress is our God. It's a prelude that Amy played this morning. Well, we know that Luther wrote A Mighty Fortress is Our God. We really don't know who wrote Psalm 46. And we really don't know the circumstances in which it was written. Many surmise that it was written at a time when Jerusalem was under siege, and that would make sense. That would make sense as this psalm has been a great comfort through the years to those who have felt under siege. And I wonder if some of you today, given the current circumstances, aren't feeling as though you are a bit under siege. Seems to me then we could use a little bit of the comfort of Psalm 46 right about now while the nations rage and the kingdoms totter. When our solid ground gives way beneath our feet, what in fact are we standing on? And where will we find our peace? Psalm 46 begins with an affirmation of faith. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. That's a picture of major disruption. This is a scary depiction of how things are not supposed to be. It's a picture of, of a world in grave disorder. The earth should be solid. The mountains should be immovable. The sea should have a boundary. It can only go so far and no further. God made these things this way, as the book of Job tells us. But here, in Psalm 46, all that has the potential to change. The picture that the psalmist paints for us is one of a world, a natural world, in upheaval. Although I think there might be more to it. When you think of mountains in the Bible, what do they often signify? Sometimes they're just mountains, but oftentimes they are places where God meets man. They are places where covenants are made. They are sacred places. These are spots where God reveals himself. Mountain peaks are thought to be a good place to go and meet with God, who Isaiah tells us dwells in a high and lofty place. So the higher up we can go, then in theory, the higher, the closer we get to God. We just came through the book of Exodus. There's mountains all through the book of Exodus, right? Moses was called into ministry where? On a mountain. Where did he go to get the commandments to bring down to the people? To the mountain. Where did the elders go in order to meet with God? They went up the mountain. What did the people do? They stood in front of the mountain, and it trembled, and it quaked, and they were scared to death. Remember, they said, Moses, you talk to us, but don't let him talk to us anymore. We're going to die if this keeps up. But God was on the mountain, right? The smoke came down and covered the mountain. We read further in the Old Testament, and we find out that Elijah defeated the prophets of Baal on a mountain. We go back into Genesis and we find out that the, the ark came to rest on a mountain. We go into the New Testament and we see Jesus taking three of his closest friends up a mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration. So throughout Scripture, mountains symbolize a dwelling place, a meeting place between man and God. And what does the sea represent sometimes in Scripture? Not always. I mean, sometimes the sea is just a place to go catch a fish or a place to, to, to sail your boat. But there are other times in Scripture where the sea represents something a little bit more dark, a little bit more haunting. The sea is frequently pictured in the Scripture as a perilous place, a place of unknowns. It's often um, portrayed as a, as a part of God's creation that is chaotic and needs to be restrained. It needs to be controlled. Water and floods are symbols of judgment in the Old Testament. When the uh, Israelites got to the shore of the Red Sea, they weren't really happy to see it because the Egyptians were chasing them down and they, they looked ahead of them and they thought, well, what we have really is death behind us and death in front of us. So we don't have any good choices. What did God have to do? God had to part that sea and make a way through death, huh? 
Amen. That's what God did. But what happened when the Egyptians followed? They went in and God folded that sea back over them. And they all drowned. They all died under God's judgment. So the sea sometimes represents judgment. It also represents evil. It represents what's unpredictable. And in Psalm 46, you've got the sea swallowing up the mountains. So I think that minimally we can say the psalmist is talking about natural upheaval, but I think also he may be talking about something with some spiritual overtones here. That is disruption in our lives to the point that it looks like good is being overtaken by evil. And that's a scary place to be, isn't it? That's a scary place for anybody to think that here we are, we've, we are banking on God, we are trusting in God, and, and we are looking at the things of God being dismantled and destroyed, and we are looking at a world that seems to be out of control, and it seems that wickedness has the upper hand. That's a very a disconcerting place for any of us to be. And I know, I know none of you are feeling that way. I know that you're all more spiritual than that, and you're so grounded in your faith that nobody's having any doubts and nobody's having any worries, and there's no anxiety or anything like that. We're all just smooth in. Of course not. Listen, our lives are being shaken to the very core. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. So if you have some worry and you have some doubt and you have some anxiety and this isn't any fun for you and you're ready for it to be so ready for it to be over, whatever, however you want to put it, if you're concerned because it looks like evil is winning the day, right? We get it. The Bible gets it. God gets it. That's what's going on. A picture of natural upheaval, I think, but also a picture of spiritual upheaval. There's a disease out there that no one can control. And it's affecting the whole earth. In our corner of the globe, angry people are marching in the streets. Lawlessness is increased, which is, which is hard enough to see. But then there are some people who are saying that that's okay. And that's probably even more alarming. That's the backdrop against which you've been experiencing life over the last three months, right? And during that time and with that backdrop, some of you have, have received some pretty scary medical news. Some people have received some scary diagnoses during this time. And others during this time have felt an inordinate amount of financial pressure because of the circumstances of the day. You've not been able to do what you're normally able to do or earn what you've normally been able to earn. And so those pressures are weighing heavy on you. And then there are still even more who are experiencing the tensions in relationships because, brothers and sisters, we live daily under an unrelenting stress. It just is not going to go away right away, and there's no easy way it seems to come out from under it. And it really is taking its toll on how people relate with one another. As you may find yourself being less patient or a little more edgy or a lot more edgy, I, there are lots of ways to describe it, depressed, worried. The, this is what we're dealing with. And then also in the middle of this, some people are, are hearing a familiar knock, a familiar pull. It's the pull of addiction, which is un understandable that somebody would want to escape the tremendous pressure that, that we are feeling these days. All this tells us that creation is out of order. It is out of order, not just in the realm of nature, but in the realm of the spirit. There's a spiritual battle raging. Don't forget that. And it may look at times like evil has the upper hand. Our mountains are being cast into the sea. Our sacred places are in danger. The world we grew up in, the world that we counted on, looks like it's fallen away right under our feet. And that makes this a perfect time for us to assess what it is we're really standing on. Because if we're standing on the world and the promises of the world and the things of this world, we have every reason to be afraid. But if it's God, if it's the things of God, then now is the time for us as believers to get a hold of ourselves. And as we just saw in Psalm 46, verse 10, and be still. That's the message of God to us. Cease striving. Stop hurrying. Jettison your worrying. Be still. 
be still and know that I am God. It makes sense, doesn't it, in a time when God's presence and power is in question, when God's presence and power is suspect, that we should set our, settle ourselves and we should take the initiative go, to go and find Him, to go and seek Him. This is not the time for you to say, Oh God, give me a sign. This is the time for you to say, I believe. I don't understand, but I believe. Where are you looking these days for solace and sense? In what do you place your hope? Is it science? Quest for a vaccine? Maybe rules and regulations that have been enacted for your safety? Maybe the news that brings a daily briefing of what may or may not be true right into your living room. If I might borrow a line from an unlikely theologian, the late John Prine, blow up your TV, throw away your paper. Blow up your TV, throw away your paper. I'm not suggesting that as Christians especially we should live in some state of, of ignorant bliss that we choose, like we're not going to engage. I'm not suggesting that we should be uninformed, but I am suggesting today that what any of us are struggling with is not a lack of information. And what we need is not more information. That's not going to make us feel better. So log on all you want and turn the TV on and look at the briefing every day, but it doesn't make you feel better, does it? You don't come away from that refreshed because we don't need more information. We need God. That's what we need. That is what we need. So be still. Cease striving. Stop hurrying. Jettison your worry. Be still. If you have not taken the time during these past three months to be still before God, everybody deals with things in a different way, whatever reason that might be that you can say, well, no, I haven't really been listening or I've sort of just put my head in the sand or I've just sort of knuckled down and tried to work my way through that, whatever it is, if you haven't taken time to be still, And I want to encourage you to to start doing that and to make that part of your daily routine. I want to share something with you that's been helpful for me. Then we're going to listen to one more song and then we'll be done. Um, Many mornings during this pandemic, especially now that the sun has warmth in it, is it so good to have warmth in the sun? I'm so grateful to God that we're going through this at this time. Because I can imagine what it would be like in the throes of winter to be so isolated and so unable to get out and do things. But now, especially that the, the sun has some warmth in it, many mornings for me consist of, at some point, I just make this break, I make a cup of coffee, I go out on my patio, and I sit down. And my patio is uh, situated in such a way that the morning sun hits it first. And so it's warmer out there than it is anywhere else. And that's not because of um, thoughtful design. I was so pleasantly surprised to realize that after I built the patio, (laughs) that the warmth hits me first right there. And sit there with that coffee and be quiet. And look around me. And around me in that backyard, nature and beauty. Listen to the birds and look at the sky. And the psalmist tells us the heavens declare the glory of God. And what I need on a day-to-day basis is a reminder of the glory of God. And while I'm out there trying to quiet my mind and being still, at some point then I, I turn on this song, which is by an artist you may never have heard of. His name is Greg LaFollette. 
But this has been one of those songs that I'm so happy that I found, and it has ministered to me throughout this time, and it may minister to you. I pray it does today. Um, yeah, let's listen to that song. The Lord is our shelter, the Lord is our strength, and he has proven himself to be a help in trouble.
When the water's raging and the winds blow, in your mercy give us hope, give us hope. When the sky is falling. Dear Lord, as we go through the balance of this week, facing all that may come upon us, help us through the power of your spirit to recognize that we stand on the solid rock of Christ. Help us then as we are encouraged by the words of our pastor, the encouragement of the words of this hymn, that we might stand without fear, fully dependent upon you as our anchor of hope and our anchor of comfort that we might actually go into the mountain to meet with God, to trust when all seems to be falling apart. That's what's called faith. Help us to be still and feel your presence. Dismiss us with your grace and your mercy and your love. In Christ's name, amen.